So we now move to our panel discussion. Uh, we will start the panel with a quick self introduction. So Jay, uh, let you go first, and then after that, uh, Agni. Sure. Hi everyone. I'm Jay Howie, as, as Brian just pointed out. Um, I'm a senior director at RBC, and uh, I have the fortunate pleasure of leading a group of very talented subject matter experts that are involved in designing all things related to network security for RBC globally. Um, I've been at RBC for almost 25 years and all in the network security space. So I've been, uh, I've, I've kind of seen the network security space grow from its uh, infancy to what it is now. So um, it's been quite a journey. And Brian, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the conversation. Thank you very much, Jay, for your support. And like Jay introduced, he has been uh, with the bank for so many years, and uh, especially in the networks, uh, network, network security field. So what uh, uh, actually Am Ami described the history, and uh, uh, Jay has a first-hand experience to have all those things, right? So that's a great uh, angle well, we can have. Actually, Ami and I go back uh, probably about at least 10 years. Um, I've known him, I mean, uh, back in the day when he, he, he used to be Toronto based as well. So, uh, um, he's, he's definitely got part of that, part of that history with him as well. <laughs> it's a small world. It is. It is. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, I know. Agony, I, uh, can you, uh, can you give another me? try? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah. We can hear you now. Good. Very cool. Okay. So hi, my name is Agni. Uh, good evening. Um. India, and I mean, it's morning here, but good evening to everyone who's on the call. Um, yeah, I, I'm currently engaged as the group CISO for Biocon, and Biocon is a pharmaceutical company. And uh, apart from this, I do a little bit of uh, pro bono working with uh, standards bodies. Uh, my experience spans about 30 years in cybersecurity, business continuity, data privacy, and risk management. And I've been contributing to standards on ISO, um, part of three uh, forums on ISO, uh, one for security and privacy, the second for continuity and resilience, and the third is for risk management. I am also part of Business Continuity Institute, and I work with them for cyber resilience, I am a speaker at various events, uh, especially the global forums from uh, EC Council and ISMG and uh, Business Continuity Institute. And now I'm here. I'm I'm happy for you know Brian calling me on online and and thank you Brian for calling me here. I'm also part of Cloud Security Alliance. Um, I've been contributing to the Cloud Control Matrix uh, version four and the auditing guidelines that came right after. So. That's in short who I am. Uh, I'm currently working on a standard for cyber resilience for the Bureau of Indian Standards. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you very much, Agony. Uh, as we can see, you have a broad uh, industry experience, a rich, uh, uh, also you heavily involved with the, the, the standard the definition, standard uh, establishment, all those uh, uh, cloud risk standards. So that's great. We, we are very honored to have you join the panel today. In fact, I'm hoping that one of these days I will be invited to contribute to the SASE as a standard. Who knows? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, I mean, we, we actually introduced you, but uh, if you can add uh, like a 30 seconds, uh, any perspective from you, from you. No, not the official introduction, but uh, yourself. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so like Jay pointed out, I'm actually originally from Toronto. Uh, spent most of my life there before moving out to California. Uh, so I had the opportunity to work with a number of organizations in, in Canada, uh, along with along with the bank, and uh, started talking about this shift to the cloud uh, over a decade ago with Jay and his team. Right. So uh, it's it's the things you know trend, when we see trends, we start sort of discussing them and planning for the changes. And sometimes some trends take take longer to uh, to sort of solidify. Right. And SASE is definitely one of those that's sort of on the scene, but it's still evolving. And still crystallizing, and uh, and you know, it, it may morph a little bit by the time it's fully baked. And we'd love to have uh, folks like Agni help can uh, contribute to that. Excellent, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, at least you escape the the winter time here, so you get a little bit warm in California. 
Uh, all right, cool. Uh, let's start our panel discussion. Uh, for people online, I also encourage you to submit your questions through chat or Q&A. We actually got uh, some questions already. Uh, in the meantime, I have uh, prepared uh, some questions to ask our panels. So let's start first with the, that question. Uh, to, to give some reason why we need to look at uh, today's topic, network security, because uh, network security kind of in the industry for long, long time, like from day one, the firewall, all those things, right? But recently, especially last two years, COVID-19 pandemic changed the whole landscape, which caused that we call it a hybrid work world, right? A hybrid work environment. So I'd like to ask our panel members, how does a hybrid work environment impact the security landscape today? Uh, I want to hear your perspective from there. Um, maybe who wants to be first? I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Jay. Yeah. Um, so Brian, as you pointed out, like for sure, the, uh, the pandemic was a game changer, right? Um, and really put uh, a lot, a, a lot of focus on certain parts of the network. Um, you know, remote access being one for sure. Uh, so a lot of our employee, you know, a lot of our internet egress services, a lot of our third party. Um, connectivity, um, you know, just the amount of data we're pushing now um, is just through through the roof, right? Um, you know, what I would say about hybrid hybrid uh, um, the hybrid work environment is, you know, without a doubt, no, it's not one size fits all. You know, I think I think hybrid me hybrid for me means flexibility, and, and the network uh, and the network security pieces need to kind of um, adapt. And, and provide and enable that flexibility. Um, I think it puts more and more pressure on the network, on network security around protecting employees um, and assets and data, um, especially with you know, us having you know, considerably more people working remotely and all over the place. Um, I think it really comes down to rethinking a lot of our network security um, infrastructures and the tools we use. You know, I, I know Amit talks about SASE, you know, I'm sure we'll get into things like zero trust network access concepts and, and a few other things, but these things are really, um, you know, coming to the forefront, um, you know, at this critical time. And I, and for me, um, and I'm probably jumping a little bit ahead here, but, you know, if I, if I look at what it means talking about, he's talking about, you know, the power and the promise of, of cloud computing and how that's, how that's translating across into providing solutions in the network security space. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely something um, you know we're 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 keeping our eye on and seeing seeing that uh, that transpire. Very cool. So the transformation, the the actually the COVID nineteen yeah. accelerated the digital transformation without a doubt. In the way to push us to accelerate and need to bring a lot of flexibility to our staffs, and also the cloud computing, all those latest technology push this. Great. Uh, Agony, you want to add anything on that one? Yeah, so uh, this SASE is not new. It didn't happen because of the pandemic, right? But it it definitely, like you said, it, it was brought forward. It was accelerated because of the pandemic, because of the situation that we are in this uh, right now, where a lot of people are working from home and uh, you have a lot of stress from valid users coming from outside the network, unlike earlier, where most of the valid users were inside the network. So I think it was developed in 2019 and, and Zero Trust, well, I think was somewhere in 2010. <clears throat> so uh, all these concepts have been around for quite some time. It's just that the real development of the tools, the, the technology, and the use cases, uh, most importantly, that has evolved due to the pandemic. So, uh, what you know, in, before we we got onto the pandemic, I think somewhere in March uh, 2020, I wrote a small note on what I believe will change over time. And though I didn't call out SASE by its name, but I did say that the security and network are going to merge, and. Uh, one of the key challenges um, that we have in today's pandemic is really not network and not security. It's more about people. So there is a sizable amount of work that's going on that's trying to make sure that 
when people get connected to your enterprise, the, the human aspect is taken care of. But let me come back to what we are discussing today. The reason that the human aspect becomes a huge thing is because you're no longer connected physically to the enterprise. And by connected physically, I don't mean by wires. I mean the human to human interaction, being in an office, and, and, and therefore, the focus of the whole world is now moving from a perimeter-based network to a, a more decentralized network where the perimeter is moving on to the guy who's trying to connect into your enterprise. So there's a transformation that has happened due to the pandemic and, and given the situation that we are in and the, given the fact that uh, the network is transforming through SASE, through other mechanisms, I think it's a good uh, space to be for uh, those who are innovating, those who are bringing newer things. And the best part is that the whole world is contributing to make things better. Yeah, so the, <clears throat> the world is different now and the way people are working are totally different. And I like what you mentioned, it's not just a centralized, it's a more like a distributed. Now you have a bigger network to manage and how do you deal with the uh, classic uh, network model? So that's the, definitely the impact. Uh, Ami, you want to uh, share more on that one? Yeah, so you know, hybrid work and, and the pandemic has certainly changed a lot of things for the industry, right? But the one question I ask myself every few days and I love to debate is, what does the enterprise network even mean today, right? All of us are at home, you know, um, presumably manage laptops, connecting to SaaS applications, doing our work, right? Like uh, we're not touching the firewall that exists out in the corporate network at all, right? The traffic's going straight on over the internet to uh, to the SaaS vendor, right? So uh, what does it even mean to have an enterprise uh, network? And then as a security, as a person responsible for security in my organization, right? How do I, like, what sort of controls can I put in place? To make sure that I can still manage our cyber risk and keep my employees safe and keep uh, keep my data safe. Right? So that's that's really what it boils down to. Yeah, that's a very fundamental fundamental question. What does the enterprise network mean to us, right? So if uh, everything change, I'm sitting at my basement, work remotely to access the enterprise. Everyone of have a, uh, like a dynamic locations. So what does that mean? Um, which actually lead uh, our next question, right? So we talk about uh, hybrid uh, environment to definitely impact our security and uh, the way we are working. Now let's narrow down a little bit to, to network security or enterprise network, uh, I mean mentioned. So based on the current situation, what do you see uh, from, from that requirement side? What are some like key requirements for the uh, or pressure to the enterprise, uh, like a large organization, like a bank, like a global company, or even <clears throat> small medium uh, customers or small medium com uh, companies? What kind of a major requirements for a modern enterprise uh, network? So, what do you see? Must we must achieve? Uh, anyone can jump, uh, maybe uh, me first, so we can, we can kind of a switch now. Yeah, I, I can, I can give you a bit of a perspective. I'm hearing that I'm hearing from our customers, right. And, and the folks we talk to, right. So there's a few different things. So the cyber threat landscape is constantly changing, right. Every few, every so often we're seeing new threats pop up on the scene. Uh, last year, we all saw kind of what happened with ransomware and all the negative effects that, uh, that came out of that, right. That's a big, that's a big shift that we're seeing. And these things are, are turning over a lot faster for now, right? There's, there's other problems in the industry, like, you know, email fraud and business email compromise. Uh, there's, there's DDoS threats on the network, right? Every, uh, every quarter or so we're seeing a new bar set in the, in terms of a volumetric DDoS attack that somebody's experienced or some networks experience. So these, these are the changing sort of threat landscape requirements that we see, but the biggest one that we see is the need for flexibility. Right, because uh, folks are not able to kind of uh, like have a, a crystal ball looking three years in the future to, to understand, okay, uh, what percentage of my users are going to be in the office versus at home, right? So, uh, so, so just having that, like that number could be 100%, could be 5%, right? Uh, and based on that, they want to keep their options open and, uh, and be prepared to shift and adapt as uh, conditions change. Excellent. 
So that's the insight from Amit, uh, from uh, his uh, observation with his clients and uh, the industry. Uh, what about uh, Jay and uh, Agni? So you're both uh, managing a large organization, the network. So what do you see from the requirement side? Let me start. Go. Okay, Agni. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, there, there are multiple areas, and I'll let Jay talk about the topics that I think he wanted to. But uh, I'm going to give a very simplistic example of what the network is evolving. And I'm going to relate it to our lives. Imagine you go into a museum, so you buy a ticket and then you enter a hall and now you're at liberty to select which one of those halls you want to go into. There's no one to check you and you can go do, go and see any part of the museum at any point of time upon your leisure. Compare that to visiting someone in a government facility depending on how and who you are visiting, broadly, you would have to go to the gate, announce yourself, show some kind of evidence that proves who you are, and then you get called into to meet the person that you're trying to meet. And then you've got to wait in the lobby before that person makes sure that you're the person who's going to meet. And there would be a secretary who would probably come and ask you a few questions or a security guard who's going to pose a few more questions. And once everything is validated, you would be ushered in to meet that person that you, you're, there, you're out to meet. Today's network and earlier network has been like these two things. Uh, earlier, the network was all about, like Amit said in his, uh, in his speech in, in the beginning, it was all about making computing systems available. And it was more like a museum. As long as you landed on the network, you had the liberty to choose which computer system you would want to connect to and what would you do next. Uh, today's network requirements are more like visiting that government officer, right? You need to be validated because you don't know who the valid user is and who the perpetrator is. Jay? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll kind of build on what you're saying and, and what Amit's saying, right? I think, I think Amit's right, flexibility scalability is, is a huge piece like we've got you know and uh, and resiliency are, are are really key concepts in the in the modern enterprise network i'm not saying they weren't in the past but i'm just i think that i think the game's kind of you know really uh you know really upped itself um i think you're seeing a lot more um focus on on um you know what whether you want to call it micro segmentation or, or workload segmentation concepts in the network as well that that kind of tie together access and, and identity concepts together as well um you know and 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 you know putting more controls around uh flows within the network um now to enable a lot of this stuff you know you're, i think you're seeing a lot of focus on things like software defined networks um program programmable networks um you know the use of apis for internet connect inter interconnectivity um, you know, and, and again, I think that I think you're also seeing now the extension of your network, you know, either, you know, not only to the cloud, um, but also, you know, in, in many cases to people's, you know, people's homes. And, and, and that that's, the, you know, it's just, you know, that whole, I think Amit had a, had a, had a diagram in his presentation around the whole, uh, you know, castle moat paradigm. That's, that's long gone, right? It's, it's uh there's a ton of holes and and access points coming out of that castle that we need to consider and, and factor into things and that's why some of these uh some of these concepts and so what 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 uh, agni was talking about around this permissioning as you move throughout the network is becoming uh, a bigger and bigger concept wonderful all right, so those are some uh, uh, key requirements you can see. So like a flexibility, uh, like a check. Uh, oh, it's not like uh, old uh, perimeter-based uh, security. You have to implement uh, all those uh, zero trust. We will touch on that a little bit later. And uh, access control and also really need to meet the current uh, the work environment. People work from everywhere. And also you want to make the system agile, flexible, uh, scalable. It's not just okay. You put it there and forget about it, right? So, so those are some uh, key requirements that we can observe. Um, all right. So, since we have these requirements, the so the, the logic, the uh, the question next is, how do we do it, 
right? So especially not everyone from scratch, right? So if I uh, like I say I'm running a startup, that's okay. I just buy the latest one, the cloud based, everything cloud native. But for a large organization, doesn't matter as a bank, the global company, or the you already have the years of infrastructure and the network model. The people get used to that. So. What do you see some, uh, what's your recommendation to transform a traditional, I'm sure a lot of companies still own a uh, traditional or kind of a halfway there, right? So to transform a traditional network model to the modern uh, network architecture. So what's your recommendation there? Uh, maybe Agony, you, you, you start first. So, um... In, in my view, there are three kinds of organizations today. Um, those who are, will not move to cloud right now, probably because of the way they are connected and the reliance on connectivity being lower, and they will come to cloud probably later, not, not right now. Then there are those who are born on the cloud, like you said, right? They, they've never seen an infrastructure problem because for them, infrastructure is a given it is not supposed to fail. So that's the second kind of uh, organization. And then the largest part of the world are all those who are migrating into the cloud, like you said, traditional migrating into the cloud. Now, uh, when you are traditional and migrating into the cloud, this migration could be called a transformation and, and so on and so forth. It has to be driven by the organization's need to go digital. And, and there are a lot of organizations who are going digital and there is a sizable amount of organization also if I were to split those who are transforming into two parts, those who are already somewhere closer to the target of digitalization of their enterprise and those who are beginning. Because there's a huge amount of digital information that is needed before uh, a network like, I mean, uh, the cloud facilities could really be used. Uh, right, because unless you have the data that you want to use for business purposes, there is no need for them to go digital for them to use cloud. So the, the whole thing will then you know, depend upon the movement and the need and, 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 the, and the impetus of the market that every organization will work with uh, to, to bring them onto the cloud because they would want to be more available they would want the data to be more uh, usable. And I'm going to bring a little bit of uh, a few of those ables from the standards perspective, right? Mm. You need to be able to have your network uh, structured in such a manner that you are that your, your business functions are repeatable and uh, comparable and therefore predictable. All right, so that's an uh, agonist point of view. So really need to look at, uh, uh, I, I love what you described. There's a, everybody is different, right? So you cannot just using one solution to fit uh, all the organization. You really need to tailor. And that's why I liked, I liked what Amit showed at the end, uh, a roadmap. It, it may be different for all these different organizations, but there has to be a roadmap. For even those who are on the cloud, they need to get used to the fact that tomorrow, Infrastructure can fail, and you need to be prepared for that. But that's a different story. I'm not going there, but I, I was just trying to contribute to your conclusion that yes, no, no one is saying you need a different solution for everybody. Right. So you need to tailor the the strategy or approach for your organization. All right. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Ami, what what you want to add on that? Right? Yeah, yeah, I can chime in. Right? Like Agni said, right, the, the roadmap approach is really key. Uh, I think there's some of uh, we talked about segmentation. We talked about micro segmentation and and putting sort of these zero trust controls in place. A couple things you can do as as a sort of a, a strategy, right? One is kind of weaving identity more closely into that equation. Uh, just having identity aware controls and policies, right? And uh, this could be kind of like working with your existing identity platform or, or, or using a new platform, but uh, I think that needs to be a big part of, of uh, the security controls and, and, uh, and zero trust. And the second is uh, uh, awareness of the endpoint, right? Like what device is this? How clean is this device? Is this a managed device or not? 
uh, that's a very useful context to kind of help start. And, and some of these things you can start rolling out using your existing uh, platforms, existing controls, right? There's integrations available and, and or you could move to a new security uh, control platform. But I think bringing these two elements in the, to the equation just really helps uh, move you further along on the SASE journey. Excellent. So that's a great add-on. And uh, Jay, what's your uh, view on this one? Yeah, this is a tough one, um, especially in the enterprise space. Um, you know, I, I think if you have the opportunity, a, a greenfield opportunity, um, you know, it's a it's a much easier transition because you can build a lot of this right in from the ground up. Um, but like you said, in the enterprise space, you know, you're always going to have that hybrid of kind of some greenfield, maybe with public cloud or private cloud, and then you're going to have have your traditional, um, you know, data centers in your in your network um, that you need to figure out. Uh, a big part of this for me would be, um, you know, really being able to map out business application flow and understanding what that is. You need to have some level of visibility. You, you need to know um, what's good traffic versus, I, I'll call it non-good, uh, and be able to, you know, be able to look at that kind of stuff in order to help you, you know, define. Policy. I think you'd need to have an understanding of, um, you know, what what you're what you're trying to protect. Um, and, you know, whether it be your crown jewels or or other parts of your organization, and, and start there. I think if you were to if you were to look at it, if you're look, uh, trying to attempt this, you know, kind of a, at a large scale, I, I don't think you're going to be successful. I think you've got to start small and and uh, and build into it. Um, that'd be my two cents. I. I guess the other piece I would add, I mean, there's a, a bunch of things happening, you know, in the network space that are trying to help, you know, this journey. You know, you're seeing a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of companies are are well on their journey, if not past their, you know, completed their journey on moving away from, I guess I'd call it like layer three networks into more um, uh, leaf spine networks that kind of help support some of this stuff. There's a lot more, um, you know, Amit talked about, uh, Software defined networking. There's a lot of prevalent, you know, a lot of that stuff happening in the enterprise space. Um, adoption of virtualization, things like that, that can really help you, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, do things at the network level, or, you know, whether it be at the overlay level or the underlay level. But you know, you can help define uh, and break the zones out a little bit. All right. Jay, Jay, I really like what you said about the crown jewel model earlier, right? Which, I mean, if you're in a large organization, you can't do it all, right? It's just too no. complex and too hard. So it really helps to kind of have that understanding of what are the important things you need to protect. Uh, start there, right? Build a plan around those and then and kind of phase it out. Yeah, excellent. So at the end of the day, you really need to know what you have first before you do any change, right? So otherwise you don't know uh, how do you measure the success and uh, how do you know when you, you, you complete some transformation percentage wise. So you need to know what do you have? And this also dynamically change. You need to always update that one. All right, cool. Uh, I do see quite many questions on, online already uh, on the chat and on, on the Q and A. Some of them uh, are quite specific or uh, tied to some solutions. So I, I would encourage uh, our panelists to uh, maybe later to, to respond to that, especially if it's a technical question, so you may want to uh, comment on that. But here I just pick up some general ones. So for example, uh, I think uh, Davey, Davey mentioned that uh, zero trust, which actually uh, uh, related to our next uh, question. So zero trust become kind of a very popular concept in the industry. So he wonders how that works with our network security and how that zero trust, how do you implement zero trust in network security architecture? Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, first, I mean, <laughs> since you, you know, talk I'll, a lot I'll about take a stab at it, right? The zero trust as a concept has been been around for you know some time, right? That, that uh, started using this term almost a decade ago. But the real gist of it is is uh, that you know in fire and network security and firewalls, right? We have this notion of like implicit deny, right? At the end, right? Which is you know not you block everything unless you explicitly allow it, right? And that's really the foundation of, of zero trust. It's default deny mode, right? And uh, but in practice, what we ended up doing is we didn't know what all the traffic flows were, and very often like the default deny model didn't work, and then. 
uh, there, and there was this allow any any that snuck into firewall policies, uh, and it just sort of stayed there, right? And uh, I think the the, the key with uh, zero trust is uh, some things like uh, network segmentation, right? Segmenting a networks more uh, more finely, so that it's like Agni was mentioning, right? The analogy between a museum versus an office, right? Uh, the other other analogy, similar, very similar analogy I like to use is a hotel. Right? In the hotel, you have your key card and you can walk into the lobby, but you can't go anywhere else unless your key card is authorized, right? You can't just walk into anybody's room. You can't go to the gym unless you have the, your, your uh, guest there. You can't go to the, uh, the, the, the premium lounge in the top floor unless you're a premium member, right? Uh, and that's the type of model we need to move towards. And that's really the gist of zero trust, right? And, and like I mentioned, like weaving in elements like identity and endpoint awareness uh, a really key to to that picture, right? So making sure that uh, the firewall, the network security device, knows who you are and what device you're com what type of device you're coming from, is a device safe at this point in time, right? Uh, those are additional context pieces that uh, that are needed to to make that access decision. All right, very cool. In fact, uh, I think um, that the network is in between. The real guru here is the application. So when you're talking zero trust, it's really about whether you are, you, all those components that you can control before someone reaches the application, are they ready to trust that connection? Like Amit said, and I think that hotel example is very, very relevant because if you have a key card, does the elevator trust you? And if it does, I mean, can I take your key card and go up? I could, right? That's one element that's not controlled. So if you had a, an elevator also complemented by the video camera that says this person with this card is not, is allowed while this person with the same card is not allowed. So that probably could be zero trust. I, I just thought I would add on to what Amit was saying. All right, so that's actually an add on to the, the, the hotel story and uh, so Jay, uh, do you want to add anything on that one? Sure. I, I, I won't add on to the hotel story. I, I don't, I'm not as creative as those, as the other two guys, <laughs> but um, I, I've just got a couple of comments. So one is just make sure that everyone understands zero trust is, is a, it's a security model. Um, I think sometimes people think it's a, a product or a solution, but it's really a, a, it's a model on how to apply security. And, and yeah, everyone's right. It's really around um you know the concept of least privilege access it ties to what together contextual um you know information whether it be so it's usually application and user right um as far as how to adopt it um again i think um i think risk appetite and security policies play a big role in, in helping you at least give giving you some framework to on how you're going to approach up creating a policy I, I think it's really important to start small um because again, it's this is going to be it's a it's going to be a journey. Um, it's especially the enterprise space is not something you're going to turn on overnight. Um, I would reiterate what I said before. I think it's incredibly important to understand your users and 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 the and their application traffic flows, um, and really mapping those flows out and understanding that. In some cases, there's some tools that help with that, but sometimes it, it also requires some. Uh, some you know data mining and 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 things like that uh, to really understand where I go with that is um, it's really important to understand intent uh, in this situation right like if you're just going to map out flows you don't know if the flows are are good flows or bad flows right so if you're going to create a policy based on what you see it may not be um, the ideal policy right um, I think you have to factor in things like multi-factor authentication into it uh, usage tracking Brian you brought that up I mean this is going to be something that requires continuous monitoring and learning. I think you're always flipping between what I would call learn mode and uh, enforcement mode because you're, you know, a lot of times, unless you've got a very, very static environment, things are going to change and, and you're going to need to uh, adapt to it. And hopefully you can build in some level of automation or orchestration to assist with that. So those would be my, uh, my big things. Excellent. All right. So like a zero trust, uh, uh, working with a network security, there are actually quite many things happening in the industry. Um, so maybe we can recap a little bit and uh, from your point of view, what are some like uh, current industry trends or emerging technology or emerging trends 
for the network security. We mentioned several things already, but here I just want to take opportunity to kind of like a recap, um, or may not be just a technology, maybe a, a compliance or maybe a standard or maybe a, a model or, or, or architecture. So some of quest, uh, some of the, our audience also ask this question. So uh, I'd like to hear your insights, the current industry trends about uh, network security. Um, anyway, I want to start. I'll do it. I'll jump yeah. in on this one. Um, definitely what we're seeing, um, huge increase in, in uh, threat and attacks. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, we're seeing huge, obviously the large volumes of, uh, of remote access workers, you know, in, in our case, you know, we, we went from having, you know, probably, probably our, our global solution for remote access pre pandemic, you know, probably supported somewhere around maybe 25 or 30% of our, of our overall work workforce. And, you know, within a matter of weeks, we went, we were now supporting like 95%. Um, uh, I, I talked about this earlier, uh, the amount of network traffic we're pushing today is, is large, is, is more than we've ever seen. Um, you know, Agni talked about, it was a really cool thing he brought up around people and collaboration. And obviously that, those, that, you know, with us now not being face to face or, um, you know, working in the same environment where, where all our collaborations happening over the network. You know, whereas probably a portion of it was only happening over the network. So we're seeing that video content, um, you know, the business is moving, you know, uh, moving more and more out to, you know, to leveraging public cloud, leveraging SaaS um, applications. So again, that's all putting strains on, on, on the network and the network security infrastructure. Um, the increase, I already talked about the increase of cloud adoption. And one thing I, we're seeing a lot of, um, I mean, this has been building for years, but more and more use of encryption. I mean, probably when I look at our um, our egress egress traffic flows, I, I'm going to guess we're probably somewhere around 97 percent of our flows are now encrypted. So those are the are the big trends that we're seeing. Wonderful. That's a great first hand experience. And um, anyone else want to uh, add on that? Yeah. Uh, so. I, I'm, I was actually looking up my previous notes that I had from a, from a meeting that we're talking about what's emerging and what is going to be probably a big thing in the future. And there's one thing that struck me very, very, uh, very, very unique. It's called as uh, moving target defense. And that's probably something that's going to come up uh, in, in a large way in the future. Currently, a few uh, vendors are doing something about it, but uh, I think Moving target defense is going to become a big thing in network security in the future. This was based upon a paper that was written by Department of Homeland Security uh, some time ago on how you can keep shifting your 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 targets uh, constantly uh, on the network. And if you're able to do that, whether you do that via decoys, whether you do that via uh, you know a particular network architecture or or a design. Or a, or, or a switch or a router or any other box that, that comes in, in front of your network and constantly keeps moving the, the targets, that's going to become something very interesting in, in coming times. Um, and I believe uh, there's a lot of research that is going on in that area. Uh, so, so the way that works is, is very simple. So imagine you're trying to shoot a target and the target shifts by two inches. You are definitely going to miss that target. And it shifted, it shifts two inches every time you shoot. So that's the concept of moving target defense, but a concept coming down to reality in terms of how it manifests itself on the network, how how cloud service providers are going to bring that, like you know, someone like Cloudflare is probably going to bring that to our tables is something that is yet to be seen. All right, moving target. So that that's a, a one thing. I actually first time hear this one. So actually, that's really interesting. Uh, Amit, you want to uh, share anything? Yeah, that, that's that's a very yeah. I agree. That's a very interesting sort of way to, of looking at the problem, right? It's a, like a little bit of the whack a mole game, right? It's uh, anytime you you feel like you've saw, you fixed one issue, the a new one pops up. But the, the, if I really sort of step back. 
uh, the big, big macro shift that we're seeing right now is, and Jay alluded to this a little bit, right, is this whole thing that I call the consumerization of enterprise IT. There is a whole host, there's a whole ecosystem of SaaS applications out there, the new one popping up every week, right? They're geared at solving or digitizing some business process, something that you used to do that was, was um, there's like a, there's smart software engineers trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this? better and make it more efficient for you and save you time and money and i'm going to deliver it to you as a SaaS application right either through the web or as a mobile app and i'm going to deliver it over the internet and that's the way i want users to consume it and our our sort of uh challenges on the vendor side is how do we ensure that we connect the user and that application it could be sitting in like aws or gcp whatever it is right how do we connect it over, over the most efficient path, but at the same time, give enterprises the security controls they need to, uh, to ensure that the users of data are safe, right? So uh, that's, that's really kind of what we're working on uh, on the vendor side uh, and trying to sort of minimize the number, number of inspections, minimize the number of round trips, minimize any, any sort of traffic tromboning that could be happening, right? That's kind of what we're focused on in, in delivering a SASE platform. Very cool. So that's actually also reflect uh, what we mentioned today. It's a different world right now. The requirements, hybrid, decentralized, and the people want a lot of a choice, flexibility. In the meantime, you have to deliver in the agile way. It's just like a pandemic. You have to overnight, like almost like overnight, like a Jay's uh, from 25%, all of a sudden become a 95 or even more. So that's actually reflect the speed and the scale of uh, of your network security to meet the current uh, industry requirements. Okay, um, all right, so I want to switch gear a little bit. Uh, I'm sure there are quite many people online uh, today. Uh, they are interested in cybersecurity or network security. They also want to tap into some latest technology or career opportunities. Since uh, network security also changed a lot, and uh, we, we we talk about quite many technologies, people ask, okay, uh, if I'm interested in this field, what kind of things I should learn? What kind of standard I need to kind of understand? What kind of compliance or uh, what kind of things I need to kind of start to pay attention to? So my next question for you is, uh, from your point of view, uh, when you build a successful, from a hiring company point of view, when you build a successful security team for a hybrid work working environment, what kind of uh, key skills or capabilities uh, you are looking for? So, which gave us some guidance to our audience if they are interested in career opportunities. All right, Jay, you want to start? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, my some of my answers might surprise you. Um, it's not. I'm not going to focus so much on the technical side. I actually think. You know, the whole this whole presentation has just been talk, we've talked about flexibility and and the, you know the speeds and scale and uh, that that we need. To, you know, basically we have to move at the speed of the business, right? Some of the key key skills I think people need to have is adaptability. Um, I think the right aptitude. Uh, I think people have to have this continually continuous learning mindset because um, things are changing so quickly. Um, you need to be you need to be prepared for that. Uh, I think collaboration, I mean, who knows, you know, where I, I don't think the world's ever going back to the way it was pre pandemic. You know, I think, I think we were, you know, a lot of, a lot of things are going to be very hybrid. So having really strong collaboration skills, um, being able to have strong written and verbal communication, communication skills is incredibly important. I also think having, um, you know, for a lot of people in the technical space for the longest time, you know, it was all about the product or the solution that they supported. And, I'm not. I'm not trying to um, uh, say that's um, not important. What I'm trying to say, though, is is understanding what the business wants. Understanding how how the how you or as an employee or or how network security security solutions can create value is very very important. So I I put down like business um, focus or or business acumen. Trying to understand kind of. Where the business is headed and, and how you can play a part in that um, is really, really important. So those would be mine. 
You actually talk about human network, right? So you talk about uh, collaboration, adaptability, and also to learn, speak other people's language to, to for the uh, purpose of a better communication. Yeah. So that's great insight. Uh, Agni, you want to share any insights from your end? Um, I'm going to try and connect what Amit said last to what Jay said now. So by the way, I, I fully agree with Jay. The technology part is the easier part. It's the other parts that are difficult. But let me go over to what Jay said. There are five uh, things that are going to come to all enterprises and they're going to seek connectivity through the cloud or through standard uh, mechanisms. One are your internal employees who are sitting in on a local area network in your offices. Uh, hybrid is not going away, right? So there are going to be some people in office. Uh, two, those people who are trusted employees and who are outside who are trying to come in. Uh, three are going to be suppliers and partners, and they would seek uh, newer, more flexible options to come in, especially those who are going to fix your problem, right? So you, your machine went down, you need someone across the world who's got the right skill sets and the right tool sets to come and fix that problem, you're going to allow them to come in. Uh, Four is your data center itself, right? So the data center is probably moving to the cloud, but it still is an element that you need to connect. And, and lastly, our instruments, OT, IoT, industrial control systems, SCADA, PLCs, all these are soon going to require connectivity to the network, uh, not only to the network, but also to the cloud, uh, directly and indirectly. The reason I said all these things is to enforce upon the point about what we need from the people. So while you may have some people who are focusing on the technology, someone would understand IoT better than someone else. But in the end, the people that we need in the cybersecurity part of the world are those who understand the business or who have the willingness to understand the business and those who have the patience to go through and be adaptable based upon whatever new things that throw, are thrown upon them. And lastly, those who have the hunger to learn new things as they happen and to use that knowledge to fulfill all these five kind of connectivity requirements of the future. Very cool. I really appreciate your input. Um, people, right? So the uh, people to understand the business, that's actually in a way is to understand the needs, why we need to do it, right? So uh, back to the targets, although there's moving targets, but we want to focus on the major target to, to, to satisfy the business needs uh, rather than you just randomly add another piece of technology to feels very cool or uh, showcase. So that's also very important. All right. I yeah, mean, one of the questions oh, sorry, that I always have, sorry, one of the questions that I'm always having to ask uh, my teams is guess it's why someone comes and tells me they, they, they want firewall as a service. Why? And I, I need this, this big thing on the firewall management system. Why? In the moment you ask those questions, you go back to what the business wants to do because cybersecurity is no longer something that you use to protect your business. Cybersecurity is going to be the cornerstone of your next business transition transformation. Totally. It's all about enablement. I couldn't agree more. Mm, absolutely. That's the biggest thing I talked about. Sorry to jump in on this, but I talked about my history, like way back in the day, it was it was a cybersecurity, well it wasn't even cybersecurity at the time, but it was about protecting. It was about defending or or you know, detect, you know, detection and maybe a little bit of prevention. Cybersecurity now is all about business on business enablement. That's the piece. And it, it's a jump. It's a, it's a, it, it is a jump for some people, but that's what it's about. It's about identifying how cybersecurity and how the network security solutions or whatever security solutions we're talking about are creating value for the business. Otherwise it doesn't matter. I, I couldn't agree more with with uh, both of you, right? Uh, it's, it's absolutely about enabling the business, enabling transformation, right? Yeah, but go, going back to what Jake said a little bit earlier, right? This whole notion of uh, 
uh, skills being sort of more more bounded and, and finite and technology driven, right? Like 20 years ago, and I you know, 20 25 years ago when I started dabbling in networks and security, it, it was it was about learning the platform or learning a particular brand of appliance from a vendor, right? And 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 that brand of appliance and that model model would probably stick around for five, six, seven years. And today's you know cloud centric world. We're seeing new capabilities and new features being released every week, right? So I think it's more important to have uh, skill. Think of skills in terms of concepts rather than individual technologies or individual vendors, right? So, so those concepts are. Uh, and then you made a point about adaptability, Ajay, which is I think really key, right? If you have that, if you have that skill, then you can take that concept and apply it to different scenarios and different domains and uh, and sort of. Uh, uh, find your way through it. Right? Wonderful. And uh, as you can see, uh, three of our panel members, they have uh, years of experience and uh, they observe all those uh, transition, uh, probably many generations of uh, uh, network things, right? So this is not the first time. This actually definitely not the last time. So this is just a part of it, of, although this is quite big. But uh, uh, from their years of experience, what they uh, share with you really is all those uh, focus on people, focus on uh, business, also focus on the big picture concept and how to put in the things together. So really you need to establish that big picture rather than just focus on one tool or, or the other. All right, cool. And uh, this pretty much come to our end of our panel discussion. We, we have uh, talked uh, almost like uh, 50 minutes um before we go uh actually i want to ask our panel members uh before we uh, finish this panel if you can make one recommendation to our audience uh regarding network security or regarding the best practice for hybrid uh, like working environment what would you like to say to them so you can only share one <laughs> due to the time uh what would you what's your top uh, recommendation and let's start with Amit. I would say, like, don't be too attached to the how, right? You may be you may be used to a certain way of doing things, but think about really what is the business need, what do you what do you what is the end goal, what are you trying to uh, achieve, and, and think more broadly in terms of like what are the different ways I can achieve this objective, right? And and the, the way that you're most comfortable with may not be the best way, right? So like that's that would be one recommendation I leave uh, the audience with. Excellent. Starting with the business needs. All right. Uh, anyone else? Go next. Um, uh, it, it may be along a similar line, but I, I think it's it's all about being outcome focused. Focus on the outcome. Right. That that should be your your, your where your, all your focus is, and then uh, you know, as Amit mentions, there there's there could be many different ways to achieve that outcome. In, you know, but in 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 it's working through those right through whether it be through iterative processes or or whatnot, but it's all about being outcome focused. Know yeah, know what know what your know what your out, the outcomes are that you're going after, and and what are going to drive the business forward. In other words, it's objectives, your 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 goals, right? So, don't lose the big picture. Excellent, Agony. You want to add? A... Yeah, I think um, we've talked about this many times, and there's one area that we did not, and that's an area of focus that I would advise everybody to, no matter what you do, how diverse your network is, whatever that you're planning, don't forget the governance and oversight. You need to have complete visibility of everything in your enterprise and the network gives you that visibility. If you have the mechanism to stand guard on every traffic that is going through your network, do it because that's going to give you value to build cybersecurity in addition to enabling the network. So the visibility is a very, very important. So it's not just for practitioners to defend, but also for auditor, like for, for compliance, for governance, like a three lines of defense. Even, right? so even for operations, you, you need visibility because if you don't know what's going on, you wouldn't have get those early indicators, which you will use to respond to a future attack. Very true. And uh, the visibility actually is the key components of uh, all the, what we talk about. 
All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, three of our panel members. Again, uh, Amit from uh, Cloudflare, uh, Jay from uh, RBC, and Agony from uh, Biocon. So I'd like to ask everybody online to give them a virtual uh, applause or pat to thank you very much for coming to speak to us. All right. Thank so you. Thank you very much. No again, I would right. love to do this again.